the conference in, in um, late January that Rhonda and the ladies are preparing, this is going to be really good. I mean, there's some great ideas that are coming out. Uh, the ladies will be taking care of uh, very nice at the, at the camp. We've got some surprises thrown into there and uh, very excited about that. So put that, put that date down, too. It's in your bulletin. Uh, you won't want to miss this conference, this ladies' conference. That Life of Love Ministries in New Tabor is, uh, is heading up and sponsoring, and uh, we are opening up unity-wide as uh, Dr. Kozlowski asked us to do that. So we're going to be doing that. So it's going to be great. Stand with me, please. And let's begin our worship this morning. A lot of announcements. I apologize to our visitors, but um, we're doing lots of stuff here. There's a lot of things happening. So, so if you bow your heads and let's pray, let's invite the Lord to be with us. Father, we are here because of you. You are our motive. You are the paramount reason that we are here today. So God, we put you first today. We just shed off all the dust of the week and all the worries of this coming week. And we focus on you. We ask, Lord, that you will receive our worship as we sing, as we read your word, and as we are taught by you. I pray that you will just receive that as a blessing from us, that your heart will be glad and you'll be pleased. Because whether we like anything that happens today, it doesn't matter, because you are the one we want to be happy. At the end of this service, we want you to say, that was good. So, Father, receive us as we embrace you today. In Jesus' name, all of God's children said... Amen. May Stanley, let's sing to the Lord our first song. We're going to sing a wonderful song. It's called Jesus. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. Yes, Lord. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is freedom. From the chains that bind us, Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me, he roars like a lion, he bled. name I call in times of trouble. There is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. He is Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks who stands in the fire beside me. He roars like the lion. He bled as the lamb. He carries my healing in his hands. Jesus. Messiah, my Savior, there is power in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer. There is power in your name. In your name. You walk on the waters. You speak to yes, the God. sea. You stand in the fire beside me. You roar like 
Hallelujah. Amen. Turn with me in your hymnals or follow with us on the screen as we read the Word of God together. <clears throat> this is sermon sensitive. You're going to be hearing this in the children's message also. It's entitled, The Parable of the Talents. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered them unto his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take, therefore, the talent from him, and give it unto him which it his has ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he that shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Wow. This is God's economy. It's different from our economy here in the country. Amen? Remain standing and let's sing to the Lord. Let's open the eyes of our hearts. Here we go. Yes, Lord Jesus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. To pour out your power and love as we 
Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Father, for your rich mercies and your rich grace. And God, we look at around us and we see what we have made of this earth and this world. And there's nothing else for us to say but holy, holy, holy. All glory to you, God. You alone are the greatest. And we just exalt you and lift you up today. Receive us today as we continue to worship your name. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. If you'd please... Take the white sheet out of your bulletin, the middle sheet. On the sheet are names of friends, loved ones. As I'm looking on here, I see a pastor, two, three. And one of them is my father. Many, many names on here. Some names are on here, the people that are with us this morning in service. And these are all people that need our prayers, that need our concerns. And I want you, as you look at all the needs. The top list there says pray for Israel. The Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we do that. Also, we pray for those that are on the missions field. Uh, I think Carolyn is here with us this morning, uh, one of our missionaries. Uh, our homebound members that aren't able to be in church, our college students, our military. Many needs on here, and 
We could take the time to read every name and go through every situation, but our God doesn't have to have that. Our God knows the needs that we have even before we ask. So what I'm going to ask you to do to pray and remember these people, if you would take your sheet, take your right hand and place it on this sheet, and I want you to agree with me as I pray, and let's intercede right now and ask God to touch, to heal, to set free, to give favor, to deliver, to minister to make us more effective as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for these names, God, and these situations. Lord, you have told us that if we have need to ask, and we ask right now in your name, we ask right now that you would touch those that need your touch, to encourage those who are downtrodden, to heal those who are sick in body. Father, to give peace to those that have storms in their lives. I pray for our missionaries that you would lift them up and strengthen them, give them Give them encouragement, Father, and inspiration as they carry your gospel wherever they're going. I pray, Father, for our students in college. You'd protect them, that you would give them favor and wisdom as they study diligently. I pray, Father, for each and every situation, Lord. I pray, God, for our military as they represent the United States of America, which we were formed on your word. I pray that you would touch our military. Be with our soldiers. Protect them in the field, God. I pray that you would give us success wherever we go, as long as we go according to your promises and principles. We thank you, Father, for being with us and giving us your peace and your power. We thank you for hearing our prayers today. Answer from heaven, Lord God, because we are your children, and Lord, we are the the apple of your eye, and we know that you love us. And we will be careful to praise you for these answers in advance of our knowledge of how it's going to take place. But no matter what, we will always love you. We will always trust you, and we will always believe. In Jesus' name, God's children said, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Ushers, if you'd please take your places at this time. Let's receive our morning tithes and offerings. The next several services are going to be on giving. We're going to be talking about the principles that God has given us when it comes to giving. And it's not just tithes and offerings, but giving in each and every way that we possibly can. So as you give today, give by faith, give according to your means, and let's just let the Lord increase it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to be a part of your work. You don't need a dime that we have. You don't. We know that. But you have chosen by your economy to allow us to be a part of that here in blessing us in the process. So, Lord, thank you for that opportunity and that blessing. We seize it right now. I pray that you'd bless the gift and the giver and increase increase our vision in this congregation. Help us to continue to be a part of what's right in this community. Help us to continue to be a lighthouse of safety and truth as we carefully and diligently share with what you've given us. In Jesus' name, God's children said, Amen. Give us unto the Lord.
above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Before you're seated, look around, find someone, make yourself friendly in the name of Jesus Christ. Greet someone. God bless you. I love that one. Waiting patiently in life. Yes, it is. Brother Jeff's got some gifts for our visitors. If you're a visitor, raise your hand right quick. We'll make sure you get there. You go. Good, good, good. That's right. We got some. Got a little package to give you. We're glad you're here. And uh, that's right. Good deal. Amen. Very honored to have our guests with us this morning. All right, children, would you please come on down at this time for our children's message? Come on down, kiddos. Here they come. How many of you were listening when we were reading the scriptures this morning? Did you do you remember the story? It was a little bit hard to understand. <laughs> um, so I'm going to retell it, and I need your help retelling it. Okay. So the story this morning was about a master, okay? And the master represents God. So who better to represent God than the one that really does represent God here today? Brother David, would you come up here? So he represents God. 
So just if you would you please just stand right there. All right. Okay. And then so in this in this story, if you remember, it says such is the kingdom of God. So this story is like explaining to us how God is and how the kingdom of God is. So when you think of kingdom, do you think of like England and the queen and all the fancy stuff in the castle? That's what I think of. Okay, so that's kind of what God is explaining, that his, his domain is sort of like a kingdom. And so this is how it works. Brendan, would you be one of the servants for me? So in the story, the, the, um, the master, he gives one of the servants, like Brendan, how many, how many talents does he give him? Do you remember? Is, well, that's good. Eventually we talk about ten, but first he gives him four talents. So, I'm sorry, five. <laughs> Half of ten. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All right, so let's count them out. Okay, the master is going to give the, the servant. Okay. Brendan, would you stand up, please? Stand up for me. So he's going to give him five what? Talents. Okay. One, two, three. Can you count with me? Four, five. Five talents. All right. Cooper, would you please be the next servant? In the story, the master gives the next servant how many talents? Two. One, two. Okay. And then there's one more servant in the story. Kara, would you be the next servant? All right. Oh, I know. <laughs> All right. The next servant gets one. One talent. All right? Okay. So, in the, then the master goes away, the story says. It says he goes away for a long time. So, how long? what's something that's a long time? Is it a long time from your birthday to your next birthday? It is, isn't it? It's a really long time. Okay. So, he's gone away. And while he's gone away, two of the servants take their money and they work with their money. And they, they work with it. And something that we would do with our money today, if we wanted to work with it, is maybe put it in the bank, right? So that we could draw some interest on it. So, we just happen to have a lovely banker here this morning, Miss Janice. So... So, servant number one, why don't you put your money in the bank and see if what happens to it? Because you are excited to try to work with what God gave you, what the master gave you, and you want to do your very best, right? Okay, so servant number two, you had kind of the same idea. So you worked with yours, not quite as hard as he did, but you worked with yours and you gave yours to the, to the good banker also, right? All right. Okay, now Kara, you get to have uh, have a little fun over here because what you what, what the servant with one talent did was what? Do you remember? <laughs> exactly. You dug a hole. This servant dug a hole. Uh, don't really dig a hole. <laughs> we we are going to replace this, but not today. <laughs> You're doing a great job. <laughs> So what did he do? He dug a hole, and what did he do with the hole? He put the money. Yeah, he wasted money. That's right. He wasted it. Good job. You're. I picked the right person for this job. You're doing great. All right. So let's act like we're burying it there. Okay. And then after a long time, the story says, what happens? What happens after a long time? The master comes back. Okay. And he asks. He asked the first servant. Where's my money? <laughs> okay. And the servant says to the master, he says, Well, he says, You gave me five talents. And so I worked with it. And I looked and I did a lot of research. And I found out that there was a really good bank. And so I put the money in the bank. And so you gave me five. But then what he says, But here's ten. He says, I'll give you ten for the five that you gave me. And so what did the master say? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the old English master. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Way to go, bud. Way to go. <laughs> and so then he comes up to the second servant, and the second servant says, 
I worked hard with what you gave me. And instead of two, now I have four to give you. And so he gives him four back, four talents. He doubled his... He's wanting me to give it to him. Oh, <laughs> okay. And then the master said... Well done and way to go, my buddy. Good All job. All right. That's right. Okay. And then he comes up to the servant who had one talent and he says what did you do with the talent that I gave you and the I servant says a hole and put it in it <laughs> good job that's exactly right and then the and so then the master said to to this servant you've got to be kidding me <laughs> <laughs> but not not well done that wasn't good you should have taken it and used it for me that's right. Okay, so, thank you. So, what what do we learn from this? Okay? So, what the what the the servant that dug the hole, another thing that that servant says was that she to, he told the the master, he said, "I was afraid." And so, the the servants that did really well, did they say they were afraid? No. no. They weren't afraid because they knew the master. Right? They knew the master. And so they took their talent and they went... Thank you, sweetie. So they went and they worked really hard with their talent. But the one who was afraid, the one who was afraid didn't know the master very well, did he? And so what we need to learn from this story is that if we want to please God, if we want to please our master, then we need to get to know the Lord so that we know how to use what he's given us to make him happy, right? Isn't that right? We want to make the Lord happy. So whatever God has given us, we need to use it really well. If we have a talent to be a teacher, or if we have a talent to be a banker like Miss Janice, or if we have a talent to be a piano player like Miss Kathy, we have to use what God has given us to make him happy. But if we're afraid... Then did that make God happy when we were afraid? No. All right, so let's ask the Lord to help us today so that we can use the talents that he's given us to make the Lord happy. Because do you want to hear God say, good job, when you see him? That's the thing I want the very most. All right, let's pray. Thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you for stories like this that help us to know who you are and help us to be able to make you happy. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to know that talking to you, reading your word, and spending time with you will help us to know you more so that we know how to please you and so that when we see you face to face, we hear you say those words, good job. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Kids, if you'd line up right in front of me. Now, what we're just the right, yeah, y'all come on this direction. Everybody move to your right. All right. So what we're going to do now is the congregation, your moms and your dads, your friends, your grandmas and grandpas, they're going to use the talent right now that God's given them. So we all have the ability to pray. <clears throat> they're going to pray that God blesses you. So with what they have, they're giving back to God. So congregation, would you stretch your right hand of promise and blessing for these kids and let's speak with them now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for these kids. We ask, Father, that you bless them, keep them, protect them, Father. I pray that you would help their homes to be safe places of refuge and comfort. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just give them all of your promises, Lord, all of your favor. I pray, God, that they would do well in school. I pray, God, that they would always have an obedient heart. And I pray that you protect them from anything the enemy tries to work and rage against them. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we call these kids blessed. And by doing so, we agree with heaven. And once our things are bound on this earth, you said as children of God, we can also make sure that they are sealed and bound in heaven. So, Father, we just we bind all the enemy's attacks against these kids, and we loose heaven's blessings into their lives so that these children will be called blessed in Jesus' name. We thank you for hearing us as we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated, congregation. Kids, you guys can go back, I think. Do we have something? We have something for you. <clears throat> Pardon me. So 
today I'm going to be beginning a mini-series entitled The Least of These. The Least of These. I found it interesting in our scripture reading this morning, and as Rhonda was just spelling out, that in God's economy, the haves and the haves not, the haves and the have nots is seen from a different angle when it comes to uh, possessions that we have. Um, we're going to be addressing some of that. And I want to remind you that God is not a God that withholds from the poor, uh, but whom He gives blessings to, He expects a lot. And in these parables, He's speaking to the believers. He's talking to us. There are people that are poor in finances and they're poor in, other, in, in morals, they're poor in spirit, they're poor in a lot of different ways. And when we look at these types of people, <clears throat> there should be a compassion that wells up in you because there's a very good chance, most of the time, these people didn't have the moms and dads that you had. Uh, they probably don't have the rich heritage that you have. And we shouldn't be judged on, a, on an equal plane because my mom and dad were good to me and with what they had, they did the best they could. And I have fond memories of my childhood. Um, I would have thought we were wealthy until I saw the people who had more. But uh, in God's economy, He wants us all to do well, but it is what we do with what He has given us. That is what determines whether we are wealthy or whether we are poor. Today I want to address that. And let's begin in Matthew chapter 25 verses 31, we're going to go through verse 46, and this is talking about what he has given us and how we are reacting with what he has given us. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence. You got it? And he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep at his right hand, and he'll place the goats at his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? <clears throat> or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? The king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home, and I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked or sick or in prison, and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Wow. So this scripture tells us our place and what we're supposed to be doing with what has been given to us. Another scripture says, to much who is given, much is required. So each and every one of us in this world today, we work very hard. And we work very hard to forge out a living. Well, most of us do. We meet responsibilities with our hard work. We do a lot of very difficult jobs. And it's a hard living sometimes. 
Let me, let's look at the word work. What does this mean? The word work is activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or a result. Synonyms for the word work are labor, toil, slog. How about that one? Drudgery. Exertion, effort, industry, service, grind, sweat. You've heard of this one, right? Elbow grease. I remember first time I heard, just put some elbow grease in it. What? You know, didn't know what that was. And travail. God understands work. He gets it. God works. And when we see that He's speaking to us about this, He knows what He's talking about. Second Thessalonians Chapter 3 and verse 10. Listen to what Jesus did for us while we were still sinners. Even while we were with you, we gave this command. Those unwilling to work will no longer get to eat. Now, Jesus understands, and we do. We all understand that in order for us to make a living, we've got to work. And if we don't work, we're not going to eat. The same is true in heaven. Yet God commands us to share. It doesn't mean that we... That, that since there's people who don't work, that we don't help them at all. There, there are sorry people. Look, there are a lot of sorry people in the world. Amen? A lot of people think that preachers are naive. They think we're gullible. They think that we'll just give anything to any and everybody. I would rather make a mistake giving to people who don't deserve it than withholding from them those that God wants to bless. And how do you know that when God blesses someone that you're not necessarily deserving it? Do you understand that? Do you understand that none of us earn or deserve Jesus' death, right? That He paid a price for us. So all of us are fitting in the category of not deserving something that we're getting. It's when we withhold from those that don't deserve it that we get in big, big trouble because we don't deserve it. I remember one time in dealing with the death penalty, I was really looking this situation over because I was part of me in my conservative upbringing. I said, man, you know, they did it, they deserve it, they deserve to die. That's a horrible, heinous crime. And then another part of me said, well, they're locked up and they can't hurt anybody else. And then this part of me said, well, if they get out, they, you know, they, could, they could hurt somebody. And then this part of me said, well, they, they deserve to die. And then I got over here and I said, yeah, they deserve to die. And then Jesus whispered in my ear, and you know what he told me? So do you. And that bothered me. I said, no, wait a minute, though. The, 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 the Ten Commandments, I mean, in, in the Old Testament law, it tells us an eye for eye, a tooth for tooth. And I was torn behind this. And then I began to think, if, if I'm an evangelist, which is someone who shares the gospel of Jesus Christ with other people, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying, you need to be saved, how could I be an executioner to say, you no longer get another decision in your life, I'm going to end it right now. Now, the state of Texas and, and many states in the United States say that the death penalty is lawful. I think that's what George Bush did when he put to, he put to death a Christian carried out the law, and he said, this is what the law says, I have to carry it out as the governor of this state. And I began to, to, to weigh things, saying, well, you know, how can I pull the switch? And in that, you get no more decisions for Jesus Christ, that's it. I'm glad no one ever did that to me. Amen? And you say, well, Brother David, are you pro-death penalty? Right? Talk to me after church, okay? <laughs> but it has to do with deserving and not deserving. It has to do with whether we deserve the blessings of God, or, we, or whether we don't deserve them and He gives them to us anyway, and what we do with what we have been given to people who don't deserve it. They're sorry as the day is long. And back to the statement about preachers being gullible. Preachers are some of the most cynical people that I've ever met in my life. We know every lie. We know every con game. We know every con job. Yet when I'm dealing with ministers, I get phone calls all the time because I'm the treasurer of the Minister's Alliance. I get calls all the time from the police department saying, uh, Joe Blow is here and, and, and they come from Nebraska and they need help to get to Trinidad or wherever they're going. And I'm thinking, well, why would they come down here if they're on their way to California or whatever? And I, I begin trying to reason. And then the Lord speaks to me and says, they don't deserve it. I know that. Let's help them. And I help them anyway. I deny my own feelings and my own thoughts because I don't want to withhold what God wants to give. And they don't deserve it, and neither do I deserve it. I don't deserve eternal life. I don't deserve blessings. I didn't deserve my mom and dad. I never asked for them. I never chose my mom and dad. God blessed me with a good family. So as a Christian, as a child of God, when I have the means to help, 
and I have the ability to do it, I will do whatever I can because I want to be faithful with what God has given me. And with what God has given me, a blessed life, God's given me a rich spiritual heritage, and God has given me His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sins, of which none do I deserve. Without God, I am sorry I am undone. My goodness is as filthy rags, the Bible says, in His sight. I don't deserve it. There's none righteous, there's none good, no, not one. We're not self-made, we're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. So God commands us to share. Psalms chapter 41 and verse 1, we're going to make the case. Oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. And let's look at another scripture in, in Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 25. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs 22 and verse 9. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Now let's move it up a notch. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 21. Uh Uh-oh, now we're challenged. If you thought you were challenged before... This will separate the men from the boys. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Now the human in me says, why? If he's my enemy, he means me harm. Why should I aid and abet my enemy to hurt me and my family? I remember back when Nixon was president, the Soviet Union was in big trouble. They had... We were right in the middle of the Cold War. Some of you remember this. And they needed food. And Nixon released millions and millions of tons of wheat to the Soviet Union. Remember this? Some of you? I remember going to my dad and said, Dad, what is going on? Why in the world would we give our enemy food to eat? Recently, more I forgot which president, but it was Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter, but recently, North Korea was in a famine. You remember this? North Korea needed help. Our sworn enemy. What did we do? We helped. We sent them food. We ministered to the people of North Korea that want to obliterate the United States. Even as I'm speaking, they are designing nuclear warheads and platforms to send them into the continental United States to destroy us. Yet, we will give to them. When people say that we're not a Christian nation, that we were not formed on Christian principles and values, they are wrong. We are the only nation in the world that does such a thing like this. If there was an earthquake in North Korea, the United States would be one of the first countries to send teams in to help them. We'd send aid, we'd send people, we'd do whatever we could to help them. Because we're based on the principles of God's Word. To help our enemy, to minister to our enemies. This is God's economy, this is what God has told us to do. America blesses others, even when they're enemies. This congregation here at New Tabor Brethren, this congregation gives to us, gives to people, gives to the community. We are constantly about what we're doing today. We're going to be marching around, walking outside, going inside. By the way, Debbie Smith's room is 211. If you want to go by there and give her an extra prayer, okay? But we're going to be walking to the halls of Colwell High School, two other churches. And we're going to be praying a blessing over them and asking God to, to, to bless this property, for his angels to have charge over this property, this is what we're doing. And we're walking in blessing. We're doing that today. We constantly give. We constantly, not only finances, but we also give of our time and our effort. And when we do this, here's what God does. God gives back. God has blessed this church. He has blessed this congregation because we are operating in God's economy. We give. Even when we think people don't deserve the help. We don't automatically judge and say, well, I don't know, I don't think they deserve... No, we don't do that because we can hear Jesus whispering back to us and say, if not for my grace and mercy, there would you be also. You see, this is God's economy. This is what Christians do and this is what churches do. And giving is not just money. you have an image for me right quick? Giving is not just cash. It's not just what we, what we have. Okay? When we think of giving, that's what we think of. By the way, those are 20s and 
fives and ones and hundreds and fifties there. When, when, that's what we think of. When I say giving, you think of, of your cash. You think of your, 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 your means and what you actually have in your hand. Giving is time. Giving is patience. Giving is effort. Giving is more than just a, a, a donation that you bring to someone, you see. Today, we're not going to bring one dime to Caldwell High School, but we're going to give of our faith. We're going to give of our prayers. We're going to speak prophetically as we walk around those, 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 at high school. When I was at the uh, intermediate school recently, we were prayer walking, the pastors were. I was walking around out there on the playground where there's some things that had happened out there. And I was saying out loud, how dare you? I was speaking to the enemy. I said, how dare you rise up? Do you understand where you are? Do you understand this is God's property? Get out of here right now in the name of Jesus Christ. See, I was giving of my faith and, and, and speaking a prophetic utterance to the things that were as though, uh, things that were not as though they were. And as we pray today, you're giving. It's not cash, it's not money, but it is definitely a blessing. It is a talent that God has given you, just as you prayed for the children this morning. Some people, they tithe to God's work, and that's good. We should tithe. That's 10% of everything that you have, you give back to the Lord. But other people, they leave God a donation, or they leave God a tip. We just come to church and we say, here you go, Lord, thank you for the service. I'm going to leave you some change and a couple of ones. We do. Don't be a tipper. Be a tither. Did you know that it is, this is true? I think the statistics is about 10 to 15% of churchgoers tithe. That means 85% of the people tip into God's work. Yet we manage to survive. It's amazing. What could we do if we were 100% tithers and not 85% tippers? This is the true of the average church in America. Most of us, we want to leave God a donation. I'm glad that God didn't give me a donation on the cross. Amen? He didn't tip me. He gave me everything he had, everything he was worth. He poured it out in his own blood for David Johnson. So that on that night that I was saved at the age of eight, he did it for me. He was thinking of me from the cross. You see, God saw man in his rebellious poverty and decided to give. He saw us. We were sorry. We were bankrupt. We were unthankful, ungrateful. We didn't even believe in Him. We didn't acknowledge Him. We certainly did not reverence Him. And while we were in that state, He gave. See, if you're waiting for someone to deserve a gift that you're giving them, you're not giving them a gift, you're giving them payment. When you give a gift, you're giving it as, as undeserved. And you're freely given as you have received from God. This is God's economy. He didn't make a donation. Jesus Christ made a commitment to us on the cross. Every time I ever give, every time I lead this congregation toward a direction where we're giving something, oftentimes it is a battle in me that I've had to win before I brought it to you. My cynical self. I'll tell you one time, this was a couple years ago, Steve Johnson and I, Pastor First Baptist, we were dealing with a lady that was at the Christian Care School. I got the phone call and and uh, she said, my daughter has been in an accident with my strange husband in Houston. My daughter is, has a head injury in the hospital, and I, I, I want to go down there. I've got to go down there. My heart was immediately pricked. I thought, wow, yeah, I'm there. What do you need? I, I need some gas money. I need some gas money to get down there. I can't get down there. I thought, okay. So I began to look, and I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm going to try to do more than what she's asking. So I began to do some research. And I was looking for the child. I called the hospital she called out. There was no such thing as that hospital. I took a lot of words that it could have been and, and took the name she gave me and, and matched it with all the... In Houston, Texas, it didn't exist. Not a child by that name, not an emergency, no accidents, nothing. All that she was telling me was a ruse and a lie. Now, inside, Paul, I got mad, right? Are you with me? I got really angry. I was... Furious. I called Brother Steve and said, Hey, we're being caught. Well, how do you know that, Brother Dave? You know Brother Steve? <laughs> so I, I gave him my evidence. I can't find her. I can't find her. This girl doesn't exist. 
So Steve did some research and he, he confirmed what I was doing. He said, what are, you, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to go to Christian care and see if there's something we've missed and I'm going to go up and ask them. I walked into Christian care and while I'm in there and I'm asking the lady, I said, do you know this lady? Mm-hmm, I know. I said, uh, she has a daughter, blah, 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 blah. And she started going to her records, pulled out, and looked, looked on the records and that girl was in her list. She had never, ever mentioned this little girl before. I don't see a daughter by that name at all. Not even close. Doesn't he have that? I said, you're telling me that this that they don't exist. That they don't. I said, tell me about this person. They come, yeah, this person has actually abused the system before. I was mad before. I was had smoke coming out of my ears now. I turned around to walk out. I was going to go over to First Baptist and tell Steve, and I ran into this lady. Oh, boy. It was on like donkey Kong. You know what I'm saying? I walked right into her and I said, I said, ma'am, I said, so your daughter, blah, blah, I set her up. I did. It was like teeing the ball up really high, Jesse. I was just setting her up. I asked her questions that I knew were not true and she was answering every one of them. I made stuff up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, ma'am. You're lying to me. I know this, I know this, I know this, and I know this. And then the lady began to, sh- her hands began to shake. She started pulling out cigarettes and smoke. She like smoked three cigarettes in, inside of a minute and a half, it seemed like, you know. I had her. I had her. And I told her, I said, what you're doing is, you're wanting to go down, because this was Fourth of July weekend, you want to spend a weekend down there. That's what you're doing. And I said, and you're using the church and the Lord's money to do this? I said, ma'am, if you want to go down, why don't you just come and ask me? You know? But instead, you've insulted my intelligence, and you're taking money from God's house. And the Lord began to speak to me. He said, be careful. Watch yourself. The lady was shaking. I had her. And, you know, if I wanted to be sad, I had my satisfaction. And I said, but I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. I've already released the money to you, and I'm going to give it to you, okay? But I want you to know that you don't lie to the church and you don't lie to the Lord. You want to go down there? We're going to give this to you, but don't you ever lie to me again. See, pastors are the most cynical. You, you bring to us a need. We're, we're, not, we're not gullible. We're not going, okay, whatever. Go, you don't know. We get it. But we also know that God has blessed us. We know that God wants it to go well with you. And I've told people, I said, tell me, tell me the truth, don't lie to me. God has blessed me with things. And in that moment, even though you say, well, Brother David, you wasted God's money. Really? Really? God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth and the fullness thereof belongs to who? God. So what I did was, I took a talent and I said, I'm going to give it to you. Just like God gave a talent to the worthless person who buried it in the the ground. Our impetus, our job is to give. And to give lovingly. And to give without judgment. Now, I'm not not telling you to go take money and fan it out into the wind and throw it away. I'm not doing that. Unless you need to. Amen? And if you do that, let me know. I'd like to come and be around you when you're doing that. But Jesus makes a commitment to us, worthless as we are, liars as we are, cheap and sorry as we are, He makes a commitment to us anyway. Anyway. While I was in my sins, while this lady was in her sins, Christ died for me, and I gave to her. You follow me? I was giving as had been given to me. I was worthless, undeserving, but yet I was willing because of what has been given to me. Amen? Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given back to you. Amen? These are the principles of God's kingdom, and this is how Christians behave. John 3.16. You know the Scripture. Let's read it anyway. For God so loved you and me that He gave His one and only Son. I had more money. I didn't go broke by giving this lady something. I didn't. Brother Steve didn't go broke by giving her something. But God gave us everything He had. Why? So that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Again, let's go to the next scripture. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So if you're going to demonstrate your love for God, then you're going to be willing to, to give to people who don't deserve it. Now, I'm not going to tell you you can't say, I don't like what you're doing, I know what you're doing, don't do this to me again. 
That's fine. You might even make them nervous and shake whatever. You, but you need, you need to give anyway because it is what God has done for you and me. What if God said, you know what, David, you're right. She's sorry as the day is long. She's lying about a child. She's violating the innocence and making up a child. Don't give her anything. You, you did right. Since you didn't give her anything, I'm going to take back my son from you because you're right, David. You're right. She didn't deserve it. I don't want God to do that. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me, God. He said, my sin is before me. It's me. I'm wrong. I've sinned against you and you only. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And you know what? God didn't. He didn't. And He won't you either. God, His righteousness, leaves ours miles in the dust. Can you imagine how Jesus felt hanging on the cross? The guilty criminals crucified justice on the cross. Wow. I don't like... When I feel injustice, it stirs me up. I want to do something about it. Jesus, while hanging on the cross, justice is being crucified by injustice. What does He say? Father, send 10,000 angels to wipe these worms out. No. No. He says, Father, this is a bad. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He gave it all for the least of these. Me. And you. If I give to the unworthy, I give to Jesus. And when I give to Jesus, He will remember me. I was telling the guys last week, we were out doing a service in Cade Lake. We were working hard, hard. And those men sweat. You know, we cut ourselves, we bled. Of all the days in fall, we picked the hottest ones, you know, in October to do that. It was a long, long day. And I'm going to tell you something. I told the guys before that, I felt moved by the Holy Spirit to tell them, guys, God remembers every flex muscle, every drop of sweat. He remembers this. Don't ever forget that. What you're doing today, God remembers. He's watching and He knows. When you're helping the least of these, you're helping Jesus Himself. So today, who wants to give to Jesus? Think about it. I want to give back to Jesus. If you want to give back to Jesus, I want you to stand with me right now. Brother Paul, would you please come? When you're challenged, when you're challenged, I want you to step up. I want you to take a stand just as you are now to give. In a couple of weeks, you're going to be challenged to, to make a commitment to these prisoners of, of young children who didn't pick their parents, but now they're stuck and they're ostracized from society. You're going to have an opportunity to bless the least of these. But today, even before that, you may be challenged to do something for someone in the name of Jesus and for the grace of God. Do it. Do it in love. Not because you're gullible, not because you're naive, but because you're a Christian. Because you give anyway, because you have been given to anyway. Paul's going to lead us in this song, and instead of our proclamation of faith that we usually do, we're going to sing this song. This song simply says, I surrender all. Nothing's going to get in my way from doing what I was called to do, and that is to share my talents with the Lord. So, Paul? I surrender all to be my freely share. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender I surrender all. Bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. Heavenly Father, we surrender all that we have, all you've given us. 
We give you our talents, God. We don't go take them and bury them in the dirt. But rather, we invest them into your kingdom, into the least of these, Father. We willingly help. We, we forfeit and forsake our own fleshly desires and our carnality. God, we give back to you as you gave to us. I pray, Father, that you'd bless us, Lord, as we give back to you. And as we defeat the enemy that tries to stop us from operating in the economy of the kingdom of God. We love you, Father, and we pledge to you to share as we surrender all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In conclusion, Jesse has something that he wants to share with us. This is a kingdom-building moment. Buddy, come on up here.